Thank you. If we could go down like Mr. Miller, Ms. O'Connell, Mr. Warren, just to get an idea from your particular industry, what is the, if you had to put a dollar figure on it, what is the cost of complying, of the, of the conflicts and the regulatory burdens that you're, that you're facing? Um, th thank you for the question. I, I, I don't know that I have a, you know, an, an actual uh, aggregate number of, of, the, of, of the amount of, uh, you know, of the compliance burden that, that we're talking about here. I, I mean, I guess I, I would just say that by, by all accounts, it's significant. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think um, it's probably even more significant for heavily regulated industries, such as my, uh, you know, colleagues here up, up on the panel. But it is it, it seems to be a problem. Uh, the compliance burdens are, are growing um, every day. Uh, and uh, again, I think they're disproportionately hitting the smaller companies in the sector even more, more harshly. I would sort of uh, echo that uh, the compliance costs, I think, vary greatly uh, based on your company size, the complexity of your operations, your staffing. Um, Inga generally, as a trade association, tries to stay out of conversations around costs for antitrust reasons, so it's difficult for me to kind of quantify that. But to your point, I mean, it, I think, you know, it does disproportionately affect smaller entities across all critical infrastructure, not just oil and natural gas. Similar to, to my fellow panelists, I'm not sure I'm able to provide a, a ballpark estimate. There will be some variance across our member financial institutions. The bottom line is firms are going to spend whatever they have to in order to secure their environments. Um, but what I will say is we have heard from firms that staff have had to work exceedingly long hours to balance the burden of regulatory compliance with their day-to-day -day security obligations. And there are scenarios where that has led to decreased morale and staff burnout. I can totally relate with what you all are referring to. When I, I, I used to conduct um, cybersecurity audits in healthcare and um, used to have to comply with meaningful use requirements and HIPAA and, and, and new firsthand um, real world scenarios where the well intentions of this place, of this town, did nothing to benefit patients and did nothing to benefit uh, the patient provider experience. So I, I'm, I would like to hear directly, because I can think of those laws in particular, um, what, what specifically, are we talking about rules that have been implemented that, are, that you're struggling with? And if it's possible to, because I, I want to I put pen to paper here and actually take note, you know, some tasks out of this hearing. What specifically, what, what policies and specifically are affecting your industry that we might be able to address? And are they laws? Are they rules? What are they? And if you could go down the line. Sure. I, I mean, I think um, the, the, the example that, that, that I cited earlier and that, that others have talked about here is, I think, top of mind for many folks, and that's cyber incident reporting regulations and requirements. You know, on the one hand, we have uh, Congress recently passing, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, CIRCIA, the, 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 the bill, a, a federal bill uh, with an idea of streamlining um, requirements and, you know, also setting up the CERC, uh, Cyber Incident Reporting Council, uh, to issue a report and streamline requirements. Um, you know, the, the, the requirements do, do vary. I mean, obviously, the CIRCIA is, is, a, is an underly, underlying le legislative regulation, but there are different requirements that, that vary of, over those, I think it was 52 in total different types of requirements and regulations on incident reporting. Um, and, and again, the, uh, it's, it, it, the, the problem is that even though we have identified the problem and, and Congress has identified the problem and set up a, you know, a, uh, and, you know, group this, the, the council to, to fix it, um, even after that report has come out, we've had more divergent requirements being proposed. An example is one of the, uh, there was a FAR regulation that was proposed just a couple of months after that, that varied from the recommendations in that report. So, I mean, that, that's the example that I would use for the IT industry is incident reporting. Ms. O'Connell? Um, I would echo the incident reporting requirements. Uh, I mean, we currently are 
required to report incidents to CISA within uh, 24 hours under the first uh, TSA security directive. We also have CIRCEA. There's also state and local reporting requirements. Um, but I would also, on the more kind of you know, risk-based kind of re regulatory side, um, I would say hastily promulgated regulations um, are also a real challenge for compliance. For example, uh, when TSA first uh, issued its first iteration of the second security directive, they required some very prescriptive mitigation measures that were either impossible to achieve in the pipeline environment or with existing technologies, or they had, um, you know, perhaps reactive and, and you know, inconsequent, like downstream impacts to pipeline reliability and safety, and those weren't considered when TSA first promulgated that uh, security directive. They've since undertaken a very robust consultation, consultative process with industry and with the other regulators in the pipeline and oil and natural gas industry to make it more risk-based and outcome-focused. And I think as long as regulations are promulgated um, with that risk-based, outcome-focused, threat-informed mentality, then they can be successful. But when they are overly prescriptive and they are reactive, um, that's where the challenge can be within compliance. Mr. Warren. Incident reporting is a challenge for our sector as well, but another place where sometimes overlap and duplication occurs is in the supervis supervisory uh, environment where one financial regulator will examine a firm on a given topic, say identity and access management, and shortly after that exam concludes, another regulator will come in and examine the exact or similar topic that pulls on the same cyber personnel and is sort of a consistent exam regulatory uh, obligation for them rather than their day-to-day -day security re responsibilities. Because yeah, it's, a, if I may, can I continue? It's a lot of work to pull all of those reports. I, I, when you're talking about identity and access management alone, to pull all of those reports and who has specific role access for any software, it can be a daunting task. And then to have to do it repeatedly and based on whatever the, the demand is for the different agency, I can absolutely see why that would be problematic. Um, so let me ask this, if it's, a, if it's okay. Are there, if, you know, if we didn't have these in place, if the federal government wasn't doing that, you, you have an innate re desire to want to have your data secure. And when there are events, they become high profile, the whole, you know, it's all over the news, your stock goes down. That in and of itself is a, is a deterrent, um, but, you, but you've got industry standards as well. Right, so you've got the industry who's creating these certification levels and these standards that that are not necessarily connected to the government. Which is which is more important to meet? I mean, which would you prefer to try to meet the industry standard, these certification levels, or to try to comply with um, these regulators? I, I mean, I, I think um, you're, you're raising a really good. Point, um, Congressman, uh, you know, I think th there are a lot of different, it, it's an important reminder that, you know, regulations are not the answer to everything, right? That, that's not going to solve all of our problems. You know, we, we, we've got regulations, we've got frameworks such as the cybersecurity framework, we've got international standards, we've got guidance, then there are administrative requirements. So there's, there's a lot going on there. But, you know, in terms, I, I, think, I think they're all important and they all have a role. But what's really most important from a com company standpoint is that, you know, everything is hopefully oriented toward common consensus-based standards and that those standards are risk management standards, right? I mean, we're talking about risk management, which, uh, you know, is not only just about defending, I don't want to minimize the importance of that, but also response and recovery efforts as well. I mean, all of this is important. Uh, you know, cybersecurity has a lot of dimensions and from, a, from the, an industry standpoint, we, we, we need to do it all, we need to do it all well. We, we just need to align and not be operating at cross purposes. Sure, I would say the golden ticket is when regulations are aligned with industry standards. Um, of course, that can't always happen, but you know, when it does, when regulations are again promulgated in a way that is consultative with the industry, that's when you can get the best result of the regulation. And I think this is a place where industry can leverage common frameworks that sort of reference 
regulatory requirements and common, common standards to sort of validate that they are where they need to be from a cybersecurity standpoint and, and hopefully streamline some of these compliance requirements. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Burleson. You did great. Okay, in closing today, I want to thank our panelists.